We're really ready to get going. All right, our first speaker, Aiden. Okay, and after, when Aiden's finished, you'll see the next set of slides to start with. Okay, Aiden. Hi there, my name is Aiden Gallant, and this is my project on ident identifying the regulators of the POTO 447 antibody binding epitope. Uh, this work was performed in the Roskelly lab in collaboration with the Wisnowski lab as well. A little bit of background on potoclixin and POTO 447. So POTO is a glycoprotein normally expressed on the surface of potocytes located in the kidney and is involved in kidney filtration. However, in cancer, it can become often highly overexpressed as well as expressed in an aberrantly glycosylated form. Potoclixin is highly correlated with poor prognosis as well as an increased mortality rate, making it a great target for therapeutics. Luckily though, our lab has created an antibody titled POTO 447. POTO 447 selectively targets the cancerous, aber the aberrantly glycosylated form found in cancer and my project takes up the role of identifying genes involved in the display of the tumor-specific glycan motif that POTO 447 re recognizes. So before the summer, our lab in collaboration with the Wisnowski lab performed a crispr i screen where we knocked down the genes rather than knocking them out as traditional CRISPR and Cas9 would. Then we looked at the total potocalixin on these knocked out lines as well as the POTO447 expression. When we, I chose genes to generate individual knockdown cell lines of, we looked at genes that were not really affecting the total POTO too much, and, but rather infecting the POTO447 binding, so those would be genes along this axis here. Once we got our chosen genes of interest, we generated the guide RNAs, we, I cloned them into a, a lentiviral vector before packaging them up with the help of the Wisnowski lab into lentiviral particles and transducing them to MDA231 breast cancer cells. Then with our resulting knockdown cell line, we performed qPCR, flow cytometry, and a few phenotypic studies on these lines. Here's a little snapshot of some of the results. Here we have the DET knockdown line. We see that there's a drastic decrease in the DET1 expression after performing qPCR, as well as this, we see a shift in the POTO 447 binding that aligns with our initial screen. Some other knockdown lines that had a strong effect included DET1 here, as well as DDA1, with a, which are both involved in the E3 ligase complex, as well as SD3 GAL1, C1 GAL T C1, which are involved in the specifically forming the aberrantly glycosylated form of potoclix, which POTO 447 recognizes. That's all I've got for you today, but if, you're, well, if you want to learn a little bit more about POTO447 and potoclixin or want to see any more data from any of these other cell lines, feel free to come visit me at poster number one at the back left of the atrium. Thank you very much for listening. Hello everyone, my name is Alessia Palumbo. I use they, them pronouns, and I am part of the Foster Lab. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting on the proteomic effects of gender-affirming hormone therapy on B lymphocytes. Safe and accessible gender-affirming hormone therapy is an important part of working toward equity in healthcare for transgender people and ensuring safe social and medical transitions. Gender-affirming hormone therapy is the use of sex hormones, sometimes in combination with anti with the aim of increasing the congruence between one's um, gender identity and physical body. While the goals of gender-affirming hormone therapy are individual, there are some generalized treatments. There are two main types of gender-affirming hormone therapy, feminizing hormone therapy and masculinizing hormone therapy, with this project currently focusing on feminizing hormone therapy. This is the use of uh, sex hormones, estradiol and progesterone, sometimes in combination with antiandrogens, to achieve uh, feminizing or androgenizing changes in secondary sex characteristics. This includes smoother skin, hair, breast growth, and changes in muscle mass and body, body fat distribution. On a cellular level, there is very little information on how these hormone treatments are affecting patients. So the goal of this research is to characterize the changes happening 
in people undergoing this gender-affirming hormone therapy. B-lymphocytes were chosen uh, for this to study in this experiment is because they are immune cells and there are already a lot of sex differences in the immune systems. Um, these immune system differences are uh, due to a combination of both sex hormones and sex chromosomes um, and usually results in stronger immune function in people who are assigned female at birth. Mass spectrometry was also chosen for this study uh, because it can quantify and characterize the changes in proteins abundance between samples and it is a quantitative data collection. So for this experiment, B lymphocytes were treated with three biologically relevant concentrations of estradiol, which resulted in a 1.6% of proteins differentially regulated. Um, this the E2 treatment um, resulted in downregulation of calcium binding proteins and apoptosis inducing proteins and the upregulation of some metal ion binding proteins and immune system regulating proteins. The B lymphocytes were also treated with uh, three different concentrations of progesterone. Um, which resulted in 1.1% of the proteins being differentially regulated. Um, this, these treatments resulted in the upregulation of apoptosis-inducing proteins and heme-binding proteins, and the downregulation of some proteins involved in transcription regulation. Both uh, treatments resulted in differential regulation of proteins involved in immune system function. The, B cells were also treated with both hormones at the same time, uh, which resulted in a unique proteomic phenotype. Some of the proteins regulated uh, in similar ways to just when estradiol treatment occurred or progesterone treatment occurred, but there were also some completely new protein regulation patterns um, and some enriched go terms due to the treatment with both hormones uh, include regulation of neutrophil and leukocyte migration and negative regulation of biological processes. Uh, thank you so much for listening to my presentation. If you have any more questions about my work today or want to hear about the data processing and analysis, please come visit me at poster two. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Andrew, and this summer I've been working with Dr. Shannon Jackson, as well as hematology residents, Dr. Nick Chornenke and Kate Lovett on a review of acquired hemophilia A in BC. So a bit of, the slides did not look like that when I made them, but we'll go with that. Um, acquired hemophilia A is a rare but serious bleeding disorder that occurs when the body develops inhibitors or antibodies to factor eight, which is a coagulation factor. Um, these fa uh, inhibitors have no genetic basis and arise spontaneously or secondary to malignancy, childbirth, or autoimmune conditions. There is currently no AHA registry or data collection in BC, so specific data is quite limited. So our main objective of this study was to use retrospective data from AHA cases between 2018 and 2023 to determine some of these benchmark um, lab metrics and presenting characteristics. So a few important things to note. First is that the median age of diagnosis was 74 years. And unlike congenital hemophilia, which is X-linked, um, the spontaneous nature of AHA means that there's a near even distribution of males and females. And as you can see on the left or on the right, 50% um, of cases were also idiopathic, meaning there was no underlying condition either. 54% um, of patients presented at the hospital bleeding at multiple sites. And this is a lot to get into for, given the time, but when broken down into major and clinically relevant non-major bleeding, you can see that major bleeding is more distributed throughout the body, whereas non-major bleeding is more concentrated as subcutaneous ENT or general urinary bleeds. Uh, treatment consists of two main parts. The first is hemostatic agents to stop bleeding. Patients spent about seven days on these. And the second to get rid of the inhibitor is IST or immunosuppressive therapy. This continues as an outpatient and patients spent just shy of four months on IST. And the results of treatment. So 81% of these patients did achieve remission whether it be full or partial. However, 8% would go on to relapse about 3.8 months following that initial remission. 
This requires another round of treatment um, like in the beginning. And lastly, just to cover mortality. So the mortality rate of this cohort stands at 30.8%. Um, and breaking that down a little bit, you can see that immunosuppressive therapy related mortality, which often occurs as a fatal infection, um, was responsible for 7.7% of deaths. And bleeding, bleeding related mortality was also responsible for 7.7% of deaths. However, this occurred um, about a month sooner than IST infections. And that covers it, but I'd be happy to answer any questions or go over some of these figures um, at poster three outside. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Anna and I've been working in the Kazakadatu lab this summer. My research focuses on rebuilding the endothelial glycocalyx for transplant protection. Many organ transplantation patients experience immune rejection, tissue injury, and harsh systemic effects from medications after surgery. Reperfusion of transplanted tissues damages the exterior cell glycocalyx, causing immune cell activation and organ injury. Using an immunosuppressive polymer of linear polyglycerol LPG with sialic acid mimics the natural glycocalyx and suppresses the immune system. The overall research focus was to analyze the barrier function and rebuilding of the glycocalyx using immunosuppressive polymers. This was done through experiments which assessed the levels of ICAM-1 attachment, or the levels of polymer attachment to the cell surface determine the optimal antibody and concentration to label ICHEM-1, and analyze the amount of ICHEM-1 detected with the polymer attached. One of these experiments was an ammonia generation assay. Ammonia is a side product produced when the conjugation enzyme reacts to attach the polymer to the cell surface in a transamidation reaction. To assess the levels of attachment, we use an assay kit and a plate reader. A reagent in the kit reacts with ammonia to produce a fluorescent product proportional to the amount of ammonia present. The figure on the right includes the ammonia generation of samples containing the polymer with different molecular weight backbones and a blank sample. Samples containing the polymer show higher ammonia generation, indicating proper attachment. During our ICHEM-1 assays, the experimental approach we used involved treating cultured endothelial cell lines with a mixture containing the polymer, a conjugation enzyme, and other components. We labeled the cells in the plate with an antibody and detached them using triple E detachment solution. The results were analyzed using flow cytometry where the median fluorescence intensity was recorded. ICHEM-1 is a cell surface glycoprotein that serves as a signaling receptor and adhesion molecule for immune cells. Because of its role in the immune response, it can be used to study the polymer's ability to protect endothelial cells from immune-mediated damage. As you can see from the graph on the left, using the antibody ICHEM-1 monoclonal HA58 successfully labeled the glycoprotein. Accessibility of ICHEM-1 should be decreased with attachment of the polymer, indicating immune cell protection. In this experiment, we first treat the cells with TNF to cause inflammation and increase ICHEM-1 expression. The wells treated with the polymer successfully show increase I or decrease ICHEM-1 expression compared to those with them. In summary, the polymer shows successful results from experimentation on cell assays and flow cytometry analysis. Ammonia generation experiments verify attachment of the polymer to the cell surface and results show successful rebuilding of the glycocalyx using polymer ligation. The polymer is currently being tested, tested on mouse models and has been tested for mouse kidney transplantation and skin grafting. Polymer backbones with different molecular weights continue to be compared to determine the best candidate. If you'd like to learn more about my research, you can visit me at poster stand number four. Hi, everyone. My name is Ben Patzel, and today I'll be presenting the project I've been working on in Dr. Stranadka's lab over the summer, and that has been to try and solve the atomic structure of PP2, PP2A, 
which is a membrane protein complex involved in the formation of peptidoglycan or the bacterial cell wall, and is also recognized as a key factor in conferring broad spectrum antibiotic resistance to a well-known hospital acquired pathogen called MRSA or methicillin resistant Staph aureus. So peptidoglycan formations comprised of two main steps. The first is polymerization of these sugar units into linear strands, and that's done by the glycosyl transferase domain shown here on PP2. And the second step is cross-linking of these peptide stems uh, so that peptidoglycan attains this strong mesh-like structure that will protect bacteria from forces like osmotic lysis. And that's catalyzed by the transpeptidase domains shown here on both PP2 and 2A. And so the role this complex plays in antibiotic resistance is shown in that beta-lactam antibiotics will in, uh, inhibit the transpeptidase domain of PP2, but not that of 2A. So that uh, under conditions where these antibiotics are present within the cellular environment, PP2A will come in and form a complex with PP2, thereby rescuing transpeptidase activity and allowing the formation of cross-linked peptidoglycan to continue. This slide here shows in very broad detail the purification scheme we use to obtain our samples. So we use established recombinant expression techniques in E. coli to produce the complex. We then lyse the cells and isolate the membrane protein fractions using a detergent called DDM. We then purify the complex using affinity chromatography, do a quick dialysis step to remove any harsh reagents, and then do a final gel filtration or size exclusion chromatography step to really clean up our sample for use in cryo-EM. And so then in cryo-EM, what we do is essentially flash freeze our sample using liquid ethane onto these small grids uh, that in turn can be used for uh, imaging our sample on cryotransmission electron microscopes, which yields as a final data set these 2D refined particle images that we can then eventually average and reconstruct into a 3D density map of the complex. And we can in turn use this map as a guide to help solve the structure of PP2, PP2A. So then th some further steps we can take is solving the structure in complex with different inhibitors, uh, notably a very interesting AI designed inhibitor made by the Baker Lab at the University of Washington. And then also to try and express this complex in Staph aureus, its native host, uh, in hopes uh, that it'll pull out with it growing peptidoglycan strands so we can learn more about its specific interactions with peptidoglycan. So if you wanna learn more, please come see poster number five and thank you for your time. Hello everyone, my name is Huria, and this summer I've had the pleasure of working at the Avge Lab where I've been focusing on advancing tuberculosis drug development. Just some background info for you, mycobacterium tuberculosis is the leading cause of death among infectious agents. Although antibiotic treatments provide an option, the regimen is very uh, long and uh, demanding. And uh, it also contributes to the emergence of multi-drug resistant strains. So um, there is an urgent need for uh, development of new therapies. One approach to develop new therapies is through screening of various compound libraries where um, new hits are identified and then that is followed by hit to lead optimization where um, they become preclinical candidates. Our lab previously did a phenotypic screening of an open source compound library called uh, GPHB against mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, and then two active compounds were identified. From those two active compounds, HS1 was chosen for further investigation. HS1 exhibits potent activity against MTB, and this is demonstrated through dose-dependent intracellular, but also in broth activity. We also tested the cytotoxicity of HS1 uh, across three different cell lines and found that it was non-toxin to mammalian cells. 
Additionally, we tested the antibacterial activity of compound HS1 across a range of bacterial strains and found that it is selective against gram-positive and mycobacterium species, but not gram-negative bacteria, which showed its selective um, role. To investigate the potential for resistant development uh, against HS1, we selected for seven resistant mutants of Staphylococcus aureus that show a four to eight fold MIC increase in comparison to HS1 by exposure to various uh, concentrations of the compound. And we focused on S aureus uh, due to its faster growth rate because it provided a more efficient selection process. We also then tested the growth profiles of the resistant mutants and found that there were variations between the wild type and the resistant mutant um, growth profiles. They were more reduced. And uh, what, what we hypothesized is that these variations in growth profiles may be linked to um, different metabolic properties, though further validation is required. To further characterize the resistant mutants, we then on went to um, perform antibiotic susceptibility testing against a range of representative um, antibiotics that um, target different bacterial processes in order to assess cross resistance. And what we observed was a very uh, interesting pattern where the resistant mutant strains were more susceptible to aminoglycosides in comparison to the wild type strain. Um, existing literature suggests that this may be due to defects in ADP synthase. Simultaneously, we also worked on chemically synthesizing structural analogs of HS1, given that drugs that show promising in vitro activity may require modifications in order to have enhanced um, potential therapeutic. And this includes improving their um, potency, pharmacokinetics, and reducing their cytotoxicity. So 20 new structural analogs were synthesized, and uh, they were tested against the range of bacterial strains in broth, and we saw very, we saw very promising activities from that. Lastly, some future directions for this project. The next phase would be comparative genomic analyses between the wild type strain and the resistant mutant strains um, using the whole genome sequencing results. And what this would enable us to find is um, specific mutations that confer resistance, insights into the drug targets, and also the molecular pathways that may be involved. Um, the ultimate goal of this project is to develop new therapies that may combat MTB and other infectious diseases. I'll be at poster six if you would like to discuss my project anymore. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jackie Higstrom. I'd like to start off today by having you put yourself in the shoes of someone who has just been diagnosed with type two diabetes. This is a disease you will live with for the rest of your life and requires vigorous management of diet, lifestyle, and medication to keep symptoms under control. Then imagine the confusion to find out the medication you've been put on may cause even more significant health risks. This is the story of our star today, the medication SGLT2 inhibitors in the context of a disease called secondary polycythemia. Secondary polycythemia is often caused by conditions that deprive your tissues of oxygen, and this could include tobacco smoking, obstructive sleep apnea, lung disease, or testosterone injections. As an adaptive response, uh, specialized cells detect these low blood oxygen levels and tell the kidneys to produce more erythropoietin hormone. This causes the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells, making the blood thicker and putting you at a higher risk of a blood clot. But this pipeline is less clear if secondary polycythemia is caused by SGLT2 inhibitors, because this medication has characteristics that both cause and prevent thrombosis. And I imagine this to be like an internal battle inside SGLT2 inhibitors. On the one hand, secondary polycythemia may increase the risk of a blood clot. Paradoxically, however, they've actually been shown to prevent cardiovascular events and cause weight loss making a thrombotic event less likely. As a result of this ambiguity, doctors are unsure how to manage this condition, and there are no established guidelines for what red blood cell concentrations are safe and unsafe. And that's where I come in. Rather than working behind the lab bench, I spent this summer reviewing medical chart data for patients with secondary polycythemia. Our goals were to investigate the incidence of SGLT2 inhibitor-induced polycythemia 
um, to investigate physician management and to find out how often thrombotic events were actually occurring. Out of 349 patients with secondary polycythemia, 7% were on an SGLT2 inhibitor. The mean hematocrit, which is the concentration of red blood cells, was significantly higher in these patients on an SGLT2 inhibitor. And this indicates that thrombotic events might be higher as well. When looking at physician management, 44% of, of patients had no action taken to treat this, and just one patient had their medication discontinued. To wrap up, the story of SGLT2 inhibitors reveals a complex interplay of risks and benefits. It highlights the need for a deeper understanding of this risk to establish guidelines to treat patients. If you're interested in learning more, you can find me at poster number seven. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kiara Sam, and this summer, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Gary Cole at the BC Cancer Research Center, where I investigated the role of SASH-1 in the generation of hematopoietic stem cells. Hematopoietic stem cells, or HSCs, are defined by their ability for self-renewal and multipotency. Their importance to us stems from the fact that once produced, they populate our bone marrow and differentiate into all types of blood cells for the entirety of our lives. It is therefore crucial that we as researchers gain a detailed understanding of their emergence in vivo. As of now, we know that HSCs arise during embryogenesis in a specialized region known as the aorta gonad mesonephris or AGM region. The process by which HSCs emerge is termed endothelial to hematopoietic transition or EHT. EHT is driven by various intrinsic and extrinsic signals that help push the endothelial cells lining the dorsal aorta towards a hematopoietic fate, ultimately producing HSCs. Our lab has previously identified the scaffolding protein SASH1 as an extrinsic regulator of EHT. Through single cell RNA sequencing, it was found that various cell types in the AGM express SASH1. However, we hypothesize that the mesenchymal population located on the ventral side of the dorsal aorta is responsible for providing an EHT promoting SASH1 signal. So what did we find? First, we sectioned AGM regions of mouse embryos and stained them with PDGFR beta. Using immunofluorescence microscopy, we confirmed the spatial location of mesenchymal cells on the ventral side of the dorsal aorta. Next, using Crelox recombination, we knocked out SASH1 in mesenchymal cells and saw that SASH1 expression was reduced in these cell populations by nearly 50% compared to wild type embryos. Lastly, this reduction in mesenchymal SASH1 expression led to a noticeable decrease in HSC precursor cells. Specifically, we observed a reduced number of pre-HSC1 and pre-HSC2 cell populations. This suggests a defect in EHT and subsequently a reduction in HSC generation. Now, why is this research important? In clinical practice, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation remains a primary treatment option for various types of blood disorders, despite its associated safety concerns and poor reproducibility. By uncovering the cellular and signaling mechanisms behind the emergence of HSCs, researchers in the future aim to generate HSCs ex vivo from induced pluripotent stem cells, offering a promising alternative for treatment. Thank you very much, and I will be at poster number eight. That was a very handsome presentation, Kirat. Hi, everyone. I am Lee. I am working with Dr. Benjamin Lai from VJH Hematology. And today, I would like to talk to you all about antiphospholipid syndrome. Oh, there you go. APS is an autoimmune disorder. It can cause very dangerous complications, such as blood clots and uh, miscarriages. To diagnose APS, we look at three laboratory results 
anticardiolipin, anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1, and lupus anticoagulant. The number and pattern of test positivity informs of, of the patient's risk of developing complications, and therefore it's important for, for clinicians to choose the most appropriate treatment and management strategy. Uh, however, in the two test platforms using Vancouver, Bioplex and Fadia, they often disagree with each other. So our study wants to uh, investigate how often do these discrepancies occur and what, can, what we can do about it. So we recruited a patient from VGH and uh, reviewed their charts and enrolled any patients that has done testing on both platforms. We found 53 out of 78 enrolled patients to have discrepant result. That's quite a lot. The next thing we looked at is uh, we look at each antibody isotypes individually. You can see here um, the box got moved around, but uh, a lot of uh, patients tested positive on Bioplex, but negative on Fadia in for these three antibodies. And, um, oh, and uh, they are similarly discrepant. The outlier here is uh, anti-beta-2 glycoprotein-1 IgM. It, it's not very discrepant. It has a 94% overall agreement. The next thing we looked at is how these discrepancies change the risk stratification and ultimately how we manage these patients. So on this table here, we charted a number of positive results on both platforms. We see that 20 patients would be considered triple positive on Bioplex, but not on Fadia. And uh, on this table, we see that nine patients would uh, have uh, APS diagnosis on one platform only. So testing patients on both platforms can help us prevent missed diagnosis. The last thing we looked at is if there is any patient characteristics that are associated with testing more discrepant. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't find anything statistically significant, but we do have two trends. First trend is that if a patient is female, older than 50 years old, or have uh, connective tissue disease, such as lupus, they, are, they have a higher odds of testing discrepant. Whereas a history of venous thrombosis or testing positive on lupus anticoagulant decreases the odds. So for the future directions, we will be continuing the reviewing process for more data. We are also looking at analyzing the data a little bit differently with different positivity cutoff points or calculating patient risk with a newer skyline. Uh, however, that's going to be a long talk. You can visit me at uh, poster number nine if you have questions or interested in this. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Madeline. I've been working at the Mizumoto lab this summer. And today, instead of blood, I wanted to tell you a little bit about neurons with my project, uncovering the role of zonial occludens one in synapse formation in C. elegans. Our brains are formed of billions of neurons and each one connects and communicates to the next through a unit called a synapse. And the formation of these synapses have been found to be regulated by signaling molecules, such as wind and plexin signaling during development. Abnormalities in its formation um, are also associated with neurological disorders such as schizophrenia and autism spectrum disorder. I'm currently inter interested in where a synapse chooses to form on a neuron, and to investigate this process with single cell specificity, I use C. elegans as a research model. C. elegans are one millimeter nematode worms. They have a three-day life cycle, and their cell lineage and nervous system have been completely mapped. They have transparent bodies that allow us for, to do live imaging of their synapses, and you can see an example of that here. And they also have a simple nervous system of 302 neurons. Out of these 302, I'm focusing on just one of these, named DA9. In this schematic here, we can see that DA9 forms 20 synapses along its axon, and we found that the placement of these synapses are regulated by both wind signaling and zonula occludens. The wind signaling pathway is a necessary signaling cascade for many aspects of development. It involves the ligand wind binding to the receptor frizzled, which will activate disheveled and go on to inhibit synapse formation. When tagged with fluorescent markers, we can see that frizzled localization is enriched in the proximal axon of DA9 in this image here. And interestingly, in the loss of function mutant of both wind and frizzled, we see excessive synapse formation in the same area where frizzled is enriched. Zonula occludens is a multi-domain multi containing intracellular scaffolding protein. 
This summer, I investigated the co-localization of ZO1 and Frizzled in this image here, and we can see that they have a very complementary localization with no overlap between them. In the loss of function of ZO1, we see the opposite of wind signaling where it has a loss of synapses in the area where Frizzled is localized. And now in the double mutant of ZO1 and WINT, we can see that this double mutant will mask the ZO1 single mutant phenotype and only show the excessive synapse formation that we see in the WINT signaling phenotype. And this is a clear epistatic relationship showing us that ZO1 is functioning genetically upstream of WINT signaling. But we don't necessarily know how ZO1 is regulating WINT signaling for synapse, for synapse patterning. This led us to our hypothesis that ZO1 regulates synapse formation through frizzled localization. And to test this, we compared frizzled localization between wild type and ZO1 mutants. And from here, as you can see with these images, the frizzled localization looks pretty much the same between wild type and ZO1. So we can't conclude that ZO1 is regulating frizzled localization. However, our next questions lie in answering, does ZO1 interact with the downstream component of the wind signaling pathway disheveled? If you have any more questions for me or would like to learn more, I invite you to my poster number 10. Thank you. Hello there, my name is Mohammed El Siraji. I'm from the Frank Duong lab and I'll be presenting our research towards membrane proteome profiling of the diseased and hypoinsulinemic liver. So high fat, high alcohol consumption go hand in hand in the Western diet and both work to potentiate chronic liver disease. MASLD and ALD are two categories of chronic liver disease, the former driven primarily by a high fat diet and the latter by a high alcohol diet. While pathologically very similar, ALD and MASLD are etiologically distinct, which means we don't see very many studies at the intersection of these two conditions. Now, if we want to recapitulate the consequences of the Western diet, this is where proteomic research needs to happen. Now, 70% of the druggable proteome is membrane-bound, and yet large-scale proteomic initiatives tend to foreclose detection of some of our most important membrane proteins. At the same time, dogma-challenging research from the Johnson Group has shown that mild suppression of hyperinsulinemia can impart a protective response against disease by lowering fasting blood glucose and body weight. And so putting these ideas together, our goal was to use mimetic-based membrane proteomics to firstly define pathophysiology of liver disease at the high-fat, high-alcohol junction, while secondly resolving, at least at the membrane proteome level, the mechanisms that underlie the protective phenotype of mild insulin suppression. Procedurally, we obtained liver from mice fed a high-fat, high-alcohol diet, and mice single copy number in the INS1 gene fed a high-sucrose diet. We then homogenized the tissue, pelleted down the crude membrane fraction, and then resolubilized these membrane proteins and detergents. We then used the histidine-tagged amphipathic peptidist mimetic to procure a library selectively enriched in membrane proteins that we could then analyze using mass spec analysis. And so assessing our most differentially regulated membrane proteins and stratifying the most perturbed biological functions in the high-fat, high-diet, dysregulated liver, we noted marked trends towards increased cholesterol uptake, increased bile acid synthesis, and decreased de novo cholesterol synthesis, all combating sort of the high-fat, high-alcohol diet. Performing the same analysis on the hypoinsulinemic liver, we noted marked trends towards energy utilization. FAM3D, one of the most upregulated membrane proteins in our data set, for example, uh, governs the metabolic shift from energy storage to energy utilization in insulin-independent fashion. And so as a takeaway, we were able to show at the membrane proteome level that the high-fat, high-alcohol diet dysregulated liver relies on compensatory lipid metabolism to restore homeostasis, whereas the hypoinsulinemic liver shows a marked trend towards insulin-independent insulin energy utilization. And so at the end of the day, the membrane proteome acts as a fingerprint for the cell and is still fairly under-resolved in liver disease pathology. Still to be defined is the unique membrane proteome at every defined stage of liver disease progression. And this is where research in our lab and by extension, research towards non-invasive liver diagnostics is really going next. Um, if you'd like to pick my brain a little bit more, feel free to visit my poster at poster 11. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Nadej Oje, and uh, this is my project, cell to spec a method for spatio-temporally resolved spare cell proteomics. So within most tumors, we tend to find different populations of cancerous cells. And these cells communicate with each other within space. And often after killing off one population with treatment, another subpopulation can come up and take its place. So as a result, there's been an increased focus on trying to study the different subpopulations within tumors so that we can treat patients better. In my project specifically, we're working on developing a method to study spatial proteomics, as proteins are how cells communicate with one another in space, and this can really impact how they're gonna to react to or evade treatments. Currently, two methods exist for proteomic analysis, but they do have drawbacks. The first method is mass spectrometry, which vaporizes the cells. Um, unfortunately though, this only works on fixed cells, so you can't really study how interactions are going to change over time. The second method is immunohistochemistry, in which cells are stained through antibody conjugation. The problem with this method, however, is that you need to know what you're looking for to conjugate these antibodies. Our proposed method overcomes these challenges and will enable a dynamic study of the spatial proteomic cell response to external stimulus. So the way we're doing this is we are using what is called a microfluidic probe for small scale sample collection with mass spectrometric analysis downstream. And the way this works is that the microfluidic probe head is immersed in a solution over top of the sample, and it uses mechanical syringes to inject a chemical lysing solution on one side and aspirate it on the other for collection. And with layering of this technique, you can lyse cells on the inside and use a buffer solution on the outside to protect the rest of the sample. As seen on the little graph, the red outside is the buffer solution. So following this collection, the sample would get purified and the proteins would be isolated and sent to a mass spectrometer for proteomic analysis. Now, in order for this method to work, we had to develop a lysing solution that was mass spectrometry compatible, able to collect the cells in as little volume as possible to try to avoid dilution of the sample, and that didn't damage the cell proteome. And the solution that we found to work best was a protease surfactant mix, which once developed, we were able to start studying to understand the impact of viscosity, flow rates, trypsin concentration, and surface coating on that cell delamination. Eventually, we were able to develop a solution that was capable of lysing around 100 cells in under 5.3 microliters. And to try to better understand this lysing process, we identified the individual and combined effects of enzymatic lysis and solubilization, and found that enzymatic lysis was the more dominant of the two as it starts the process by cutting transmembrane proteins before the surfactants come in and solubilize, sort of popping the cell like a balloon. Uh, recently, we've also started running our collected lysates through a mass spectrometer. And we've been getting some protein readouts, however, they're a little bit low. And so future work is going to involve trying to increase this protein yield from collected samples and really validating what we're collecting. Thank you very much for your time and attention today. And feel free to come see me at poster 12 if you have any questions. Okay, so just um, while I change um, slide, um, folders, uh, everybody, you can take a stretch, don't disappear, all right? And I'll see if I can do this. Don't leave though. Oh. It's not easy. How are we doing, Kate? I don't like jokes. Ah. All right. Good. Okay, everybody stretched.
Got it. Okay, no serums. Who's up? We're ready to go. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nastrin Davilu, and I am an undergraduate student in the Integrated Sciences Program at UBC. Today, I will be presenting my project titled Quality of Life in HPH Disease, Thalassemia Intermediate and Thalassemia Major, a Comparative Study. This project is supervised by Dr. Ali Ahmed, a pediatric hematologist at BC Children's Hospital. Thalassemias are inherited blood disorders caused by genetic changes in hemoglobin affecting oxygen delivery throughout the body. HPH disease, um, which is hemoglobin H disease, is a significant form of alpha thalassemia and is prevalent in Southeast Asia and increasingly in North America. Patients often experience chronic anemia requiring frequent medical interventions that impact quality of life. Our primary objective is to quantify and compare health-related quality of life outcomes among patients with HPH disease, thalassemia intermediate, and thalassemia major. We use established instruments like the SF36 to assess physical, emotional, and social aspects of quality of life. Additionally, we identify and compare patient characteristics, treatment regimens, and complications. Our study involves patients from BC Children's Hospital and St. Paul's Hospital with 30 patients from each group. We engage both children and adults from each group using standardized quality of life surveys and extracting clinical and laboratory data from medical records. We have conducted a thorough literature review. Here are some of the findings. Firstly, transfusion-dependent thalassemia patients generally maintained stable or improved quality of life due to uh, regular transfusions and iron chelation therapy, while non-transfusion-dependent thalassemia patients face more significant quality of life impairments. Additionally, treatments like luspatercept for transfusion-dependent patients improve quality of life and help um, reduce the transfusion burden. Iron chelation therapy, particularly with deferotherox, improves outcomes while, but poses some adherence challenges. Moreover, while children with thalassemia report a lower quality of life compared to adults, chronic pain remains a significant issue in adults, highlighting the need for effective pain management strategies. Finally, disparities in healthcare systems across um, different regions, as well as disparities in access to treatment, also affect quality of life. Comprehensive healthcare plans and routine quality of life assessments are essential. Patient data collection and analysis for our study is ongoing. Previously collected data for patients with HPH disease have been examined and factors such as age, hemoglobin levels, and iron status were noted to impact clinical outcomes. Our goals include enhancing clinical management and support for patients with HPH disease, thalassemia intermediate, and thalassemia major. By understanding the quality of life outcomes in these patients, we aim to address the specific challenges they face and improve their overall well-being. I'm going to be at poster 13. If you'd like to come and learn more about my project, thank you so much for your attention. Hello, my name is Nathan Millward. Uh, this summer, I have been working in the lab of Dr. Brown at BC Children's Hospital uh, to develop a scratch assay to investigate the adenosine deaminase 2 mediated effects on cell growth. Uh, so deficiency of adenosine deaminase 2 is a rare disease caused by biallelic loss of catalytic function variants in the adenosine deaminase 2 gene that results in a range of clinical manifestations, including vasculopathy, immunodeficiencies, and bone marrow failure. ADA2 itself is a homodimeric secreted enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of adenosine to inosine, though its roles in human physiology are not well understood. None of the suggested roles of this enzyme explain the wide range of clinical manifestations associated with DATA2. The ADA2 gene was first identified as an orthologue to a family of proteins called the uh, adenosine-related re growth factors, or ADGFs. 
Uh, these were first identified in insects. Growth factors are important molecules for normal development of cells and tissues. Previous investigations have shown growth factor activities of several ADGF family proteins, including IDGF found in flesh flies and ADGFA found in fruit flies, uh, but not all ADGFs are known to have growth factor activity. Our objective here uh, is to develop a scratch assay to investigate putative growth factor functions of the ADA2 protein. Chinese hamster ovary cells were stably transfected using the flip-in transfection system to express wild-type uh, human adenosine deaminase 2, as well as two pathogenic variants associated with data 2, the L351Q variant and the G47R variant. Cells are first grown to confluency in BD cell confluency inserts uh, within a 24-well plate to create a reproducible scratch area. Uh, throughout the trial, bright field microscopy is conducted, um, and cell-free areas are quantified using an automated plug-in and image J, allowing closure between cell lines to be directly compared. Before we could directly investigate ADA2-mediated effects, I needed to establish positive and negative controls for the assay. Coltrimid, which is a microtubule inhibitor, and recombinant insulin-like growth factor uh, have been shown to decrease and increase cell-free area closure. An LDH assay did not indicate coltrimid-induced cytotoxicity at concentrations as high as even 200 nanograms per milliliter, as well as cell proliferation assay indicated that growth of CHO cells is improved in the presence of IGF-1. Recent experiments have examined the difference in growth between flip and show cells transfected to express the wild type ADA2 protein, as well as the two data 2 associated variants. Both pathogenic variants result in the abrogation of catalytic activity, despite the variants falling in very distinct regions of the coding region of the protein. Uh, the abrogation of catalytic activity was confirmed in an adenosine deaminase 2 uh, activity assay. Future replicates are necessary to better inform potential conclusions. In the future, we will also look to involve human cell lines grown in the presence of the enzyme as well as substrate adenosine to better elucidate conclusions. If you'd like to ask me any questions, I'll be at poster 14. Hi, everyone. My name is Puniz, and this summer I worked at Dr. Conway's lab exploring links between thrombosis and type 2 diabetes. Patients with type 2 diabetes are at increased risk of developing blood clots. But why? Why is thrombosis associated with diabetes? There are three transmembrane proteins called CD248, then insulin receptor, and finally tissue factor that are expressed in fat cells. And we believe that the interaction between these three proteins play a role in having more blood clots in patients with diabetes. Number one, previous research at Conway Lab, both in vivo and vitro studies showed that CD248 interacts with insulin receptor, which is involved in metabolism, and causes insulin resistance. And as a result, we have obese mice. At the same time, number two, CD248 interacts with tissue factor, which is a major initiator of the clotting cascade and increases its activity. As a result, we have more blood clots. Finally, number three, we are interested to see if tissue factor has an effect on insulin receptor and vice versa. But first, we need to know if these two proteins are even close to each other on the cell membrane. By looking at the panel on your right side, you see these red dots. These are cells that express both insulin receptor and tissue factor. And the red dots indicate that these two are close to each other on the cell membrane. And on the left side, we have a negative control. Although we know that these two are close to each other on the cell membrane, does that mean that they actually bind or interact? And to test that, we did an ELISA using purified proteins. Looking at different directions, we discovered that CD248 binds to insulin receptor, CD248 binds to tissue factor, and finally and most importantly, insulin receptor indeed binds to tissue factor. As a result, we have this trimolecular complex of proteins that are all close to each other and directly interact. Finally, knowing this tri-complex of proteins helps us understand that insulin glucose pathways are actually connected to blood clotting and identifying which regions of these three proteins interact can help us come up with therapeutic targets for patients who have more blood clots and diabetes. 
Thank you. My poster number is 15, and I will be there for more questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Parisa, and I'm also from Dr. Conway's lab. And today I'm going to talk about my project, uh, which was mitigating thromboinflammation on biocompatible surfaces by inhibiting complement activation. So in today's world, the use of biomedical um, blood contacted devices, such as heart stents and vascular grafts, are increasing. The challenge with these devices, though, is our body um, recognizes them as foreign and can initiate immune responses, such as inflammation and um, the activation of the complement pathway. Here in this image, um, as you can see with the red arrow, factor D is a central component uh, to the complement activation. So our goal for this project was to create a, an anti-inflammatory biocompatible coding for biomedical devices to inhibit this factor D. To, and we're hoping to dampen the thromboinflammatory responses. So our strategy includes three steps for making this coding. First of all, for our base coding, we use polydopamine or PDA. And next step, we wanted to um, immobilize our anti-PEG antibodies on the surface of this PDA. Now, why are we using anti-PEGs? It's because for next step, we wanted to bind a pegylated factor D aptamer, which can inhibit the activity of the factor D. So before all of these, we uh, tested uh, to see if our pegylated factor D aptamer actually works. And as you can see in this graph um, with the blue line, it, it indeed works because with increasing concentrations of it, we could decrease red blood cell lysis. Our next step was immobilizing our antibodies on the surface by a process called violation. And we validated this by two steps. First of all, we tagged our antibodies with fluorescence tag secondary antibodies. And uh, we imaged them with confocal microscopy. So as you can see here um, on the image in the middle, uh, we have more fluorescence in compared to our um, left image, which is our control, when we use non-violated antibodies. And this means that we could successfully immobilize our antibodies on the surface. And next step was using quartz crystal microbalance as a means of showing real-time binding of our antibodies to the surface. As you can see in this graph, uh, mass is increasing over time, which confirms binding. And lastly, we tested our final coding of PDA, our anti pig antibodies, and our pegylated uh, uh, FD aptamer. And here our data suggests that the coding has the potential to decrease red blood cell lysis. As you see here, the black bar shows our bare PDA coding, which, which is a control for red blood cell lysis. The pink and purple bars indicate our complete coding. And um, as you can see, we could decrease red blood cell lysis. However, this data needs uh, further validation steps, and that will take us to our future directions, which are trying more validation trials for our final coding with the pegylated FD aptamer, and then a further step for this project can be trying to directly immobilize the factor D aptomer to the PDA coding without the use of antibodies. My post number is um, 16, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rayan Ramadan, and I'm here to present our study on identifying predictive markers for the development of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, uh, or AHA, in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or CLL. This is done under the supervision of Dr. Heather Leach. So a bit of a background, AHA is characterized by autoantibody-driven hemolysis. If it's IgG-mediated, this is known as warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And if it's C3D autoantibody-mediated, this is known as cold agglutinin disease. So in about 50% of cases, this could, be underlying, this could be as a result of an underlying lymphoproliferative disorder. And in this study, we will be focusing on AHA secondary to CLL and how we can predict it. So our methodology consisted of a total query output of 1,056 CLL patients. There were 520 with complete files and 165 within the study dates and a prior CLL treatment. And there were a total of 24 CLL AHA patients. As you can see on the table on the right, about 20% uh, of these patients developed AHA in reaction to the use of fludarabine. 
So we compared uh, autoimmune hemolytic uh, anemia-free survival or the time from CLL diagnosis to the development of AHA between patients with uh, available FISH panels, so testing for deletion 17P, uh, 13Q, 11Q, and trisomy 12. And as you can see in the Kaplan-Meier curves, um, you could see trends towards a higher incidence of AHA in deletion 17P patients with a P of 0.07 uh, and a lower incidence of AHA in patients with trisomy 12, which is interesting since none of the trisomy 12 patients ended up developing AHA at all. Uh, on flow cytometry, this is not supposed to look like this, but pretend it's perfect. Uh, there was one marker that was significant for a higher rate of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and that was CD11C. So CD11C negativity uh, was significantly predictive of higher rates of autoimmune hemolytic anemia in CLL patients. So all of these markers were actually incorporated into a feed-forward neural network with 50 nodes per hidden layer. Uh, this was a multi-layer perceptron model, and the model reached a peak accuracy of 100%, but it varied upon different testing sets uh, with an area under the curve of one. So in machine learning, this indicates a near-perfect classification of the prediction of AHA versus no AHA in CLL patients. To summarize our outcomes, we found that CD11C negativity is significant as a predictive marker for autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Trisomy 12 and deletion 17P both demonstrated trends towards significance uh, for less incidence of AHA, and we provided a, a step towards a proof of concept that machine learning models could provide valuable clinical tools for the prediction of AHA secondary to CLL. And our next steps include the development of a graphical user interface, as seen on the left over here, uh, to be able to aid um, clinician use of this model, and also prospective testing within prospective cohorts. Uh, thank you, and my poster number is 17 if you wish to further discuss this. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Sajida and I am a student in Professor Karen Chung's lab. Before I begin, I would like to thank everyone on the team of Silicon Photonic Biosensors for their contributions to this work, as well as the Center for Blood Research for the opportunity to speak. Today I'll be talking about Silicon Photonic Biosensors for multiplexed biomarker detection, specifically focused on the goal of bridging diagnostic gaps in women's health. Current medical technologies offer accurate quantitative lab-based diagnostic tests or rapid, low-cost, portable, home-based diagnostic tests, but little that combines the advantages of both. This leaves a significant gap in our ability to deliver comprehensive data of lab-based tests in a widely accessible and rapid format. This gap we are trying to fill through silicon photonic biosensors. These biosensors are specifically helpful for various health monitoring applications because often you would need to be doing some of those applications at home. So for example, monitoring hormone levels in women is challenging because fluctuating hormones require frequent, even daily longitudinal measurements to really understand their impact on female health, uh, including fertility, cardiovascular health, and menopause-related symptoms. When low concentration or small molecules such as hormones bind to our sensors, a weak detection signal is produced. Our research aims to address the signal by developing techniques to improve the sensitivity of our sensors so that we can use silicon photonic biosensors to really detect those smaller molecules and biomarkers um, effectively. We'll start off with an idea of surface functionalization, and that's modifying our surface. We compared polydopamine-based antibody immobilization, which is coding antibodies onto our chips, um, to allow them to specifically recognize biomarkers that we're looking for in the different solutions that we're testing. We compared this to passively adsorbed antibody immobilization and found that the PDA-based one was able to improve and enhance um, the signal that we were able to detect um, and effectively detected label-free detection of 3.125 nanograms per milliliter of a protein called interleukin-8, which is a small biomarker um, that is about 8 kilodaltons. 
we moved into signal amplification of that target molecule. So we've functionalized our surface, we've made it better in that way, and now we're thinking about how can we amplify that signal even further. We compared two enzymatic substrate solutions. One is the tetramethylbenzidine solution, um, specific for blotting, and this increased our iolate signal by a factor of five. The other amplification reagent we compared to was the 4 chloronephthal solution, and this one increased the factor by a factor of 500. One last thing we decided to explore was the regeneration of the sensor surface, and this is allowing us to reuse that sensor over and over again to perform similar types of tests. From this, we found that amplification, when it is used in our system, um, regeneration is not as effective. And so you can see the downward um, trend of our binding rounds. However, some efficacy is seen without amplification. So this means further optimization is required in order to be able to reuse these sensor surfaces um, and have effective regeneration after amplification. I'll end off with some of our future directions. We will continue to look into enhancing that sensitivity of our barrier sensors so that we can detect smaller molecules like hormones, interleukin-8, as I suggested over here, um, and also continue to look into ways to regenerate that surface of our sensor in order to be able to make it an effective tool for people to use at home and really anywhere else in the world. With that, my poster is number 18, so you can come and ask me questions if you have any. All right, awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Simray, and today I'll be talking about my research, which focuses on the association of HIV, age, sex, and other chronic latent viruses with inflammation under the supervision of Dr. Cote. So I think a common thing we can all begin with is how we often love looking and feeling young, and this raises the question, why do we yearn to slow down this clock of aging? A key reason is that generally our bodies tend to be their healthiest during our younger years. However, as the general population ages, our immune system health declines, and this is especially true for people living with HIV. So to understand this multifaceted age-related decline in people living with HIV, it's critical that we examine those factors that are contributing to the ongoing chronic inflammation and accelerated aging in those living with HIV. While we know the effects of some of these factors, the role of chronic or latent viruses is still not very well understood and warrants further investigation. And my project does just that by investigating the association with these four listed correlates on the right, especially viruses, to help determine their role in chronic inflammation and ultimately accelerated aging in those living with HIV. So that being said, what are those viral infections that we're looking at? These are the seven viruses. They do produce a lifelong infection within the host, similar to individuals with HIV, and they have very similar uh, risk factors as well as routes of transmission, same with the people that are living with HIV. Surprisingly, unlike HIV, some of these viral infections, such as Epstein-Barr virus and cytomegalovirus, actually have a very, very large prevalence among the general population. So for this project, we used participants living with and without HIV enrolled in the KARMA cohort. Uh, we used an ALICA assay to measure levels of three gut inflammation markers and one immune system marker. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'll be going over the results for IFAB. So this is a multivariable bubble plot. It's used to show the association between multiple variables. Here we're looking at the relationship between IFAB levels and age, while also looking at the number of non-HIV viruses. So each circle here is a participant. The size of the circle indicates the number of non-HIV viruses that each participant has. The greater the circle, the more number of non-HIV viruses that the participant has. So here we found that as age increases, participants tend to exhibit greater levels of inflammation. So the older you get, the more inflammation you're exhibiting. We also determined that males tend to exhibit greater levels of inflammation. Uh, here we're looking at the same plot, but now we're looking at HIV status. Again, we determined the same thing about age, but we also determined very surprisingly that there is no association between people living with HIV and the IFAB levels, which is pretty interesting. So to summarize, we found significant age, sex, and virus-specific differences 
that lie in people living with HIV, with men exhibiting higher levels of not only IFAB, but all inflammatory markers, uh, which are not shown here. Moving forward, we'll be performing segregated and multivariable analyses to investigate the independent associations of these factors, but as well as other things like ethnicity and substance use. And we're really hoping that these findings will better our understanding of the factors that affect HIV and potentially may contribute to understanding how we can slow down that clock of accelerated aging for people living with HIV that I mentioned earlier on in the presentation. So if you too want to live on forever, which I can't promise you will, but if you want to learn more, please visit my poster. I'll be at number 19. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Susan. I had the pleasure of working in the Prize Day Lab this past summer, where my research looked at tissue factor enhancers on the viral envelope. So coming off a global pandemic, I'm sure we're all intimately familiar with some of the consequences of viral illness. A conserved complication across many different classes of viruses is dysregulated blood clotting. So in normal human physiology, we have this delicate balance between bleeding and clotting. A virus infection can tip the scale to either end, leading to increased risk of strokes, heart attacks, shock, as well as other hemostatic complications. A reason for this dysregulated hemostasis is because viruses can pirate a host-encoded protein called tissue factor, which I've abbreviated as TF here. My slides also did not look like this, so please forgive the formatting. Tissue factor has two main physiological roles. It's the main initiator of clotting, and it's also implicated in cell signaling. So its presence on the virus envelope provides a mechanism to contribute to infection and pathology. It's acquired when viruses bud out of this host cell membrane, where they get an outer covering from the host cell itself. Now, the host cell membrane is home to a lot more than just tissue factor. Endothelial protein C receptor, or EPCR for short, is a tissue factor enhancer that also resides on the host cell membrane. While we know that tissue factor is present on viruses, we don't know if this is the case for EPCR. So my research looked to establish that EPCR is also incorporated into viruses alongside tissue factor. To do this, I used Western blotting to detect tissue factor, shown on the left here, and EPCR on the right, for cell lines, which are shown above, as well as five purified virus samples generated from the above cell lines. The bottom line of my experiment here is that tissue factor and EPCR are both incorporated into viruses, but it's dependent on availability. So this is to say that if a cell line has EPCR and tissue factor, then both will be found in the virus as well. But if a cell line does not have these two proteins, then you won't find either one on the virus. To work around this availability constraint, we wanted a model with a cell line that had both EPCR and tissue factor, which we could then grow viruses in. So we infected EA cells, which reportedly expressed both tissue factor and EPCR with dengue virus. In this follow-up experiment, what my preliminary data suggests is that dengue virus is also capable of incorporating EPCR into the virus itself, but it has to be grown in these EPCR expressing EA cells. To conclude, tissue factor enhancer EPCR is indeed incorporated by viruses, but its assimilation alongside tissue factor is dependent on host cell expression of these two proteins. This more broadly contributes to our lab's central hypothesis that tissue factor and EPCR are logical broad spectrum antiviral targets. If you're interested in this last question, please visit poster number 20, where I'd be more than happy to discuss these two proteins as pan antiviral candidates. Thank you for listening. Hi everyone, my name is Vivian, and today I'm here to talk to you about immune thrombocytopenia in British Columbia. I was supervised by Dr. Haley Merkley. So to start off with, immune thrombocytopenia is 
um, a disease where you have isolated thrombocytopenia or low platelets. And as you may know, platelets are important for clotting. So one of the um, risks of this is potentially a life-threatening bleed. Severe ITP is defined as having platelets less than um, 30 times 10 to the 9. And typically, it's a chronic disease in adults, and it presents with a relapsing remitting pattern. So um, it'll be OK for a bit, and then not OK, and then back to being OK. And this is why patients often with severe ITP often require multiple lines of therapy and not just um, a one fixed solution. So um, the common first line therapies include steroids and IVIG, but because these are typically rescue treatments, they also often need second line treatments. So things like TPORAs and rituximab. Evidence shows that TPORAs, one of the second line treatments I mentioned, are very effective and safe and cost efficient, but unfortunately, access is limited. So for example, in Canada, um, in the provinces of Ontario, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan, uh, they have quite rigorous prerequisites for TPORA funding. For example, you must have failed a splenectomy, failed all first line treatments, and failed two second line treatments before they would consider funding this effective drug. So as a result of this, many patients then receive prolonged courses of suboptimal therapies, for example, chronic IVIG, chronic steroid use, et cetera. So the hypothesis of my study is that patients in BC have difficulty accessing second line therapies, resulting in reliance on suboptimal therapies, um, increased health system costs, and increased patient morbidity. Um, and so my objectives are to determine the incidence of severe ITP in BC and determine the patient outcomes, which are unknown. So currently, a retrospective chart review is underway, where, where um, we are enrolling patients with these inclusion criteria, as well as these variables, such as blood product usage and cost of care estimates. Um, yes. So in terms of results, data collection is ongoing. Um, we are currently doing a retrospective chart review. And so far, 1730 unique patients were identified from a provincial list of ITP patients. And um, I've completed 185 reviews, and of these, 36 met inclusion criteria. And as you can see in the pie chart, majority of these are newly diagnosed with the remainder being um, chronic and persistent. Some interesting things are only 11% of patients received TPORAs, which is quite low number. Um, that brings me to the end of my presentation. If you wanna know more details, please visit me at slide 21. Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Blay and I am a medical student at UBC working with my colleagues on a project that focuses on sickle cell disease screening in Nepal. Today I will be presenting a 10 year review on sickle cell disease screening and education that has been done through UBC's Nepal sickle cell disease project. Sickle cell disease can be a very threatening condition, especially in developing countries like Nepal. This is because accessing care can be difficult, treatment is expensive, and symptoms can decrease quality of life. Imagine this, there is a 40-year-old farmer working to support his family in rural Nepal. He has sickle cell disease. His symptoms, which include fatigue, shortness of breath, and severe episodes of pain, are preventing him from working. This is not only a crisis for him, but also a crisis for his two daughters and his wife who depend on his income to survive. Our project aims to address situations like this through a screening initiative that allows people in a rural region of Nepal to get screened for sickle cell disease. Once individuals have access to a diagnosis, they can receive government subsidized medication. In my presentation today, I will give you some more information about sickle cell disease, I'll give you some background on our project and I'll chat about our results. Sickle cell disease is an autosomal recessive inherited blood disorder that results in the sickling of red blood cells. These, these, the sickling of red blood cells can lead to symptoms such as severe pain, organ damage, and increased susceptibility to infections. Because of this, it's really important to identify and manage the condition to improve quality of life. 
In Nepal, there is an increased prevalence of sickle cell disease in a rural region called Dong. And this is where our project focuses its efforts. Malaria was previously endemic to this region, and this led to um, the evolution of malaria resistance and therefore an increase in the prevalence of sickle cell disease. To give you some background on our project, this project was started in 2015 with two key goals. One, to support sickle cell disease screening in Dong, Nepal, and two, to increase community education and awareness about sickle cell disease. Uh, these are our results over the last 10 years. So since 2015, 6,083 individuals have been screened for sickle cell disease, of which 9% screened positive. Some additional findings is that women are more likely to participate in screening with two times as many women showing up at our screening camps. As well, government support has increased over the years. Originally, when we started this project, blood samples actually have to be sent to India for patients to re receive a diagnosis, but now it is possible to get a diagnosis in Nepal. And last, there is significant stigma that exists around a sickle cell a disease diagnosis in Nepal. Next steps for this project include working with local stakeholders to implement sickle cell disease screening for newborns. Second, to continue to increase advocacy and awareness about the disease. Third, to implement a pharmaceutical literacy program. And lastly, to uh, implement a pain management education program. Thank you so much for listening.